Welcome everyone to this week's IGP Soundbite seminar. Our speaker today is Sarah Ichioka. Sarah is an urbanist, curator, and writer who currently leads Desire Lines, which is a strategic consultancy for environmental, cultural, and social impact organizations. In previous roles, she's explored the intersections of city, society, and ecology within leading international institutions related to culture, policy, and research. Sarah's outlook is global, interdisciplinary, and future-facing. She's been recognized as a World City Summit Young Leader, one of the Global Public Interest Design 100, a British Council Cultural Leadership International Fellow, and an Honorary Fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Before relocating to Asia, Sarah served as a director of the Architecture Foundation here in the UK and the co-director of the London Festival of Architecture. Sarah's critical writing has been published by the Serpentine Gallery, the Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism, the Barbican, the Mies van der Rohe Award, and the Urban Age. She's frequently asked to share her perspectives in globally recognized media outlets, including CNN.com, Monocle, and BBC London. Her latest book, co-authored with Michael Pollan, is titled Flourish, Design Paradigms for Our Planetary Emergency. Sarah has also served as an advisor or judge on many projects, including the Milan Triennial, the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge, and the European Prize for Urban Public Space, as well as the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Awards Initiative. Sarah was raised in California and holds a degree from Yale University, as well as the London School of Economics. Sarah, welcome. We're really excited to have you here with us, and we really look forward uh, to what you'll have to tell us about your talk, which is titled Symbiotic Urbanism for Mutual Prosperity. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bauman. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening from Singapore. Um, I was just telling colleagues that a very loud thunderstorm has just subsided here, so hopefully it will not interrupt our, our wonderful conversation at, during your lunchtime. I'd like to thank uh, the IGP for the wonderful invitation to contribute to your developing discourse about the future of prosperity. And I'm expecting that I'm going to learn just as much from uh, the assembled uh, thinkers here today as I am going to share. Today, I'll be focusing on an idea about urban prosperity and even prosperity generally could potentially be reimagined and how it simply must be achieved in order to uh, ensure the future flourishing of our societies. And afterwards, I look forward to a lively discussion on how this relates to the Institute's agenda. So in the public imagination, or at least in the dominant paradigm, prosperity is frequently associated with development and development in turn is often imagined as enabled through competition. Uh, these assumptions sum up what we might call the competition paradigm for imagining prosperity. Last January, uh, close to home uh, where you, my hosts are, uh, the City of London Corporation released the results of a study showing how London compares to other world cities across 95 different metrics of global competitiveness for the financial and professional services sector. Uh, this study ranked London first ahead of New York and Singapore. Uh, the city boasted of its trade surplus and number of unicorns, but the study also warned that London could lose its position without further investment. Not long after, the British Ministry of Finance decided that one of its new objectives would be to ensure the global competitiveness of the UK, and especially London, in the financial sector, uh, potentially leading to more business-friendly regulations, which as we know is often a euphemism for less socially friendly regulations. Um, it was also around this time, at uh, the same time that the leveling up white paper was presented to parliament aiming to address the rampant class and geographical disparities apparent in Britain. A 2020 survey by King's College London found that over 60% of all Britons, regardless of professional affiliation, were concerned about disparities between the more and less affluent areas. So the Johnson administration is launching this program that seeks to give everyone the opportunity to flourish in their words. Uh, yet, much of the proposal is actually about making British cities, again, more globally competitive. 
The white paper opens with charts comparing the cities with one another and with the rest of the world, uh, based on the premise that cities are engines of growth. Uh, the leveling up agenda aims to reduce inequality by boosting globally competitive cities in every region to grow the private sector, redistribute jobs, and ensure that Britain remains ahead of the curve. Uh, the persistence of this phrase, globally competitive, shows us that cities around the world see their path to development as necessarily being one of zero-sum competition with other cities for capital, for talent, for influence. This competition manifests itself in the built environment, which is one of my prim primary areas of work, through the race to build ever taller skyscrapers and ever larger mega projects. And it leads to policies that pursue the expression of the city's power, regardless of their effect on the majority of people or the rest of life on our planet. Uh, much of this competitive thinking is powered by metaphors inspired by Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. Darwin proposed, as we will all remember, that organisms evolved via a process of competition as so-called desirable traits would survive and better adapt species to their environments. Darwinism was of course influential to many social scientists who used it for their own aims. Um, Herbert Spencer, for example, coining the phrase survival of the fittest and beginning a movement that applied this concept to view complex political, economic and cultural systems through metaphors which would pit the strong against the weak. These metaphors unfortunately persist until today uh, in our dominant culture, um, you know, one of the founding fathers of Singapore is constantly is forever quoted as saying, "There's always someone else looking up, looking who wants to eat your lunch." Um, we are told that we need to compete, and that this competition necessarily leads to better products, better societies, and, and a better world. And as Neil Brenner argues in Critiques of Urbanization, as cities around the world are coerced to secure their quote prosperity through battling each other for a higher position in the hierarchy created by global economic restructuring. Thought leaders continue to use the phrases such as survival of the fittest in prescribing how cities and countries should develop for years to come. This, of course, sees cities seeking metrics by which to measure their strength against other cities and uh, pursuing an obsession with growth. But even early works in global city theory, most notably Saskia Sassen's research on spatial polarization, observed that cities that developed in this manner were prone to internal inequality. The book Splintering Urbanism by Stephen Graham and Simon Marvin depicted the concentration of infrastructure and development uh, into wealthy enclaves in ways that create new forms of segregation and precariousness uh, that may worsen social tensions. And indeed, the economist Joseph Stiglitz noted that an economy in which most citizens are doing worse year after year is not likely to do well overall in the long haul. Moreover, lest we forget, these social inequalities are further compounded by the challenge that faces us all, the existential climate and ecological crises of our own creation. Uh, the IPCC's latest report issued just this week, of course, emphasized yet again uh, the, the increasing gravity of these threats and called upon world, world leaders yet again <laughs> to act more urgently. So I think we can agree that the single-minded pursuit of economic growth is contributing to record-breaking temperatures and adverse effects that are already destroying lives, lands, and livelihood. Competition isn't working. It's in response to this crisis that my um, dear friend and respected colleague, Michael Pollan and I were delighted to introduce our recent book, uh, Flourish, which is our gentle manifesto for regenerative design. Uh, Michael is of course the founder of Exploration Architecture and a leading architect in regenerative design. I would encourage all of you to learn more about his work. Um, we were inspired to write Flourish because of our concerns that the built environment sector is failing to rise 
to the challenge of the climate and ecological crises. Buildings create almost 40% of greenhouse gas emissions and rapid urbanization means that the area of the earth devoted to buildings is expected to double by 2060, exactly in that same closing window of time um, that we've been told that we need to dramatically reverse course um, on the way that, um, that we do so many things. If we continue business as usual, we will easily overshoot the IPCC's emission targets, that's clear. It's also clear that there's a need that there is a need to find another paradigm in which we can imagine prosperity and in which we can imagine human and planetary development. In our book, we argue that it's important, uh, inspired by Danella Meadows, uh, that it's important to begin from the paradigm and from challenging the frames, stories, and metaphors that shape the mindsets with which we as societies imagine our collective future. Um, and as we've seen uh, with the example of natural selection, it's more important than ever to challenge the metaphors that we use as our starting points. So where can we begin to find inspiration for a new metaphor, uh, for one that could be as powerful to the public imagination as natural selection, but kinder and gentler to each other and to the planet? The place that we start is back in biology. Um, our knowledge of evolution has, if you'll excuse the pun, evolved far beyond Darwinism. Um, an emerging paradigm, or not even emerging, but we're now well-established paradigm in evolutionary biology is that of symbiosis, uh, which the biologist Lynn Margulis explained as the living together of organisms. Um, Margulis, through her seminal discovery that eukaryotic cells evolved through the amalgamation of prokaryotic cells established our understanding of what we now know as symbiogenesis, a process that not only exhibits harmless coexistence, but also lends itself to the appearance of new tissues, new organs, and other new and beautiful things. Up until Margulis's uh, seminal paper, or suite of papers, scientists believed that species differentiation occurred only through mutation and competition, and where interdependence was observed, it was uh, regarded as an exception to the norm. Symbiosis enriched biology. It helped to explain the interspecies cooperation, made more visible by the discipline of ecology, and more importantly, it led many to question Western science's assumptions of distinct boundaries between species and uh, within individuals and feeds directly into current trends of uh, thinking about the earth holistically as a system where all parts are interrelated and codependent. Many of you will also, of course, recognize Margulis as the co-creator with James Lovelock of the Gaia theory. And it makes all the more sense, at least in Michael's and my view, uh, in light of emerging research that challenges the assumptions that we as humans are inherently selfish and inherently self-interested. Uh, the writer Rutger Bregman, for example, has found that many classical studies, sorry, classic studies, purportedly proving human sadism have actually been discredited or show other uh, outcomes when they're replicated. And primatologist Franz Duvall you know, built a huge portion of his career showing patterns of conflict reconciliation and an understanding of fairness among some of our near relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees, and even, you know, slightly more distant cousins like wolves, birds, and dolphins. Furthermore, while many point to childhood selfishness and wars as evidence of our inherent violent nature, um, People like George Mambio have assembled the evidence that children as young as 14 months develop a capacity for altruism, even before social conditioning. While the amazing writer Rebecca Solnit has assembled evidence that humans tend to collaborate and to design impromptu systems to help each other survive crises like disasters and indeed war, which is of course very much on everyone's mind these days. So this understanding that we can live together cooperatively and become something better together in the process should make us question our dominant culture's assumptions, especially in the social and developmental sciences. 
that new and beautiful things arise from self-interested competition. Of course, this understanding is by no means a new one. Indigenous cultures around the world have long understood the concepts of interconnectedness and reciprocity for a long time before the word ecosystem entered Western science around 1935. And in our book, uh, we discuss amongst other examples, the work of literature scholar, James Agude about the Southern African principle of Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu is often summarized in English as I am because we are. And Agude explains it in the quote you see here as a relational form of personhood. As a human being, your humanity, your personhood is fostered in relation to other people and indeed uh, in relation to your broader ecosystem and even um, a broader spiritual system. Um, part of Ubuntu is the co-agency humans and the environment both have through their interdependence. Um, other articulations of related ideas include Mitikuye Oyasen, which uh, translates as all my relations or relatives in the Lakota language and philosophy, or Nepantla, which uh, translates as weaving into one in Nahuatl language and philosophy. And these are far from abstract or extinct philosophical expressions. Um, they've been expressed in, in the way societies developed across cultures, even as, and especially in the practices of design and settlement building. Different cultures have developed practices of community building based on communal solidarity. Um, and I'm very grateful for my own personal learning about this subject to the architects Sudar Kadka and Alexander Furunes uh, in their research that documented many of these practices and um, stretching from Norway to Brazil and, in, uh, and on to the Philippines. And I'd love to focus on this latter example uh, for a bit, um, the concept of Bayanihan uh, for a bit it, because it's been the subject of lively conversation for anthropologists in Southeast Asia where I'm based. Uh, the term Banyanihan is derived from the Tagalog word Bayan, which can mean town or nation. And anthropologist Gertrudis Ang says that at its core, this term is about mutual aid and cooperative labor exchange motivated not by self-interest, but an understanding that getting this work done would benefit the common good. Its most famous representation, uh, perhaps one directly relevant to us working in the built environment, is the practice of many people living, lifting a house with bamboo poles and carrying it together to a new location whenever a community has to move. Ang stresses, and her colleagues in comparative anthropology agree, that Bayanihan is not exclusive to Philippine culture, but rather a local manifestation of a wider observed tendency of human, human communities to lean towards cooperation. Some might wonder how relevant these constructs are in today's world, but the concept persists into modern Filipino culture, where it's a powerful metaphor used in everyday conversation and evoked in times of crisis when people work together to cooperate and rebuild. When the Philippines experienced COVID-19 lockdowns that shut down wet markets, for example, the concept inspired volunteers across the country to set up community pantries where people shared fresh produce and essential items to help each other. And returning to Agude's work on Ubuntu, he notes that African urban sociology shows that networks of support which mirror those in pre-colonial societies arise among contemporary rural to urban migrants seeking to counter the alienation that accompanies modern urbanization. Their cooperation defies modern expectations of a quote, survival of the fittest mentality among urban residents and demonstrates their belief that in what Ogude says is a quote, moral obligation to support those around you. Indeed, the symbiotic paradigm is one that has always existed alongside us as a species, and it makes more sense than ever in the face of our planetary emergency. 
So what would it look like to practice symbiogenetic design in our modern world? I'd like to invite us to look briefly into three examples of how these principles can be translated into concrete actions, starting very small with a local community project and then ending with the application of these principles in citywide decision making. Um, in the first example, I was really honored to have witnessed the creation of, of this first case during my time as the uh, director of the Architecture Foundation in London. Uh, Gibbons Rent is a community garden that was commissioned to reactivate a neglected and actually conflict prone cut through near London Bridge Station. As part of the garden building process, uh, potted plants were contributed by area residents and local businesses who took part in the animation of the space. The sense of not only ownership, but also co-ownership, I'm oh, sorry, not only contribution, but also co-ownership meant that the garden cultivated not only plants, but also a community of gardeners and users. The project was commissioned by Team London Bridge, the Business Improvement District, uh, curated by the Architecture Foundation and designed by an Australian architect called Andrew Burns in collaboration with a British landscape architect, Sarah Eberly. It wasn't a one-off intervention. It's a place that dynamically shifts with season and the interests of the community. The project is powered by a premise that fundamentally involves local participation and commitment, design that encourages interdependence and leadership that seeks to empower local communities. Formal structures of cooperation have been essential to ensure the long-term success of Gibbons Rent, which will be having its 10 year birthday this um, coming summer. Gibbons Rent's maintenance is overseen by Team London Bridge. Uh, and uh, by the St. Mungo's Putting Down Roots Initiative, which creates employment for formerly unhoused people from the local area. Their commitment to the project and placemaking in the Linden Bridge area more generally shows the benefits of having strong institutional community partners with aligned values who can bring together disparate uh, local interests. So with, with the three examples uh, we'll be talking about, I'm hoping to show the necessity of going beyond intention towards creating creating systems that actively and equitably engage residents, businesses, and organizations in the stewardship of their communities. Uh, symbiogenetic systems can help to foster long-term cooperation, interdependence, and mutual care. This approach to community governance has been translated to much larger scales uh, through the form of the eco-village. Intentional community thought leaders, Robert and, and the late Diane Gilman, defined an eco-village as a community that harmlessly integrates human activities into the natural world in a way that enables healthy human development and guarantees true sustainability into the indefinite future. These do not have to be new developments. They can be created through the reconfigurations of existing urban spaces, which is all the more important as we try to build a low carbon uh, future approach to our built environment. And they now number in the several hundred thousands around the world. And I was fortunate to spend um, a year studying them in the context of post-industrial American cities several years ago. Um, in the example uh, I'd love to discuss today in Los Angeles, co-founder Lois Arkin wanted to bring the eco-village movement to Los Angeles uh, she'd originally been planning to build a Los Angeles eco village from scratch somewhere in a leafy suburb. Um, but the 1992 uprising against racialized police brutality, um, which decimated most of the vicinity around Koreatown where she was living, uh, made her realize that it was important to implement such a community in her own neighborhood and to try to actively live principles of ecological and social justice where she was. At present, around 40 uh, intentional residents who move specifically to participate in the Eco Village live in three retrofitted residential buildings. These old buildings were given new life with community facilities like bulk food stores and edible gardens, composting and water recycling systems, and social spaces that facilitate community building and collective governance. 
a street between two of the buildings, which you can see here has had its sidewalk widened and now has planting at uh, rain filtration beds and a shared garden, not to mention the splash of uh, community created color that emphasizes pedestrian priority in this very car centric uh, metropolitan area. These design strategies uh, are essentially supported by formal structures and nonprofit organizations that have been built from the bottom up to ensure truly sustainable operation for the eco village. The village's purchase and development of old properties is financed through an ecological re revolving loan fund, which is fueled by small investments from both personal lenders who are known to the village organizers, as well as institutions that align with the village's principles. The Beverly Vernon Community Land Trust was founded to exercise stewardship and ownership of the land, removing them from the property market to safeguard their affordability. And lastly, several Eco Village members founded the Urban Soil Tierra Urbana Housing Cooperative, which has as its mission an emphasis on affordability, diversity, and the demonstration of regenerative living. These actions resulted from decisions reached through a consensus process, which those of us who've participated in such process know involves Quite, quite a lot of intensive engagement uh, with members in attending weekly meetings and regular shared meals. The result is not only a community that has flourished since 1993, but also apartment rents that hovered around half of market rate when they were last surveyed. On top of these structures, Eco Village members have also founded initiatives that benefit not only themselves, but also the broader community in their area, uh, which primarily consists of low-income families from diverse cultural backgrounds. For example, their bulk food buying scheme supports farmers in the region, their child care center, which operates as a cooperative and um, paying a living wage, is open to families from the wider neighborhood. Uh, Los Angeles Eco Village was also the birthplace of the nonprofit Bicycle Kitchen, uh, a model so successful it's been replicated across Los Angeles. So with this combination of strong principles, communal commitment, and good design. Uh, it's no wonder that the Los Angeles Eco Village has achieved many successes, not least being a low co-ownership, low car ownership rate that stands at 30% of the regional average, despite being in the middle of infamously congested Los Angeles. Well, co-author Michael and I believe that a fundamental shift in mindset necessitates major changes in the way we govern, design, and build together. I also want to emphasize that current structures willing to change can quickly adapt and reshape themselves to match a change in mindset. I feel incredibly blessed to have had the opportunity to be in contact with the Seoul Metropolitan Government via the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism several years ago. Uh, Seoul's metropolitan government was established around the same time as the LA Eco Village in 1995, after the end of, um, when the end of the Cold War and uh, South Korea emerging from military rule. At the time, centralized planning was top down Sorry, at the time, centralized planning and top-down decision-making were common, justified by government assumptions that people would choose what was best for them individually short-term over a long-term common good. However, the metropolitan government experimented with participatory planning in increasingly bold ways. From around the 2000s onward, surveys were conducted to gauge public opinion about the future of the city. And in 2009, over 70% of Seoul residents registered their belief that their quality of life should be a higher priority than economic competitiveness. After human rights lawyer and activist Park Won Soon, now uh, deceased, was elected mayor in 2011, Seoul facilitated the creation of citizen participant groups, representatives of the Seoul citizenry from all backgrounds that would directly participate in decision-making. 
These groups participated in creating the 2030 and 2040 Seoul plans, and the government encouraged the involvement of minority group representatives in this process. The city's vision statement was selected by online vote, uh, South Korea having one of the highest digital penetration rates in the world. Uh, Seoul emphasized public participation, even as it adopted smart technologies. Even their GIS systems were designed to facilitate public interaction by non-specialists. And expert management actually didn't go away. Rather, the nature of this engagement changed with leaders facilitating the conversation and working not just for, but in tandem with local communities. Seoul is of course today known as a highly innovative city that uses local feedback to implement solutions that the rest of the world looks to. One famous example, although not perfect, but has influenced how Seoul communicated with local stakeholders and the broader public was the restoration of the stream in the center of the city at Cheonggichung. Cheonggichung was covered up by an elevated highway at the peak of Seoul's industrialization, leading to negative impacts on both the the physical and social environment of the area. The highway's removal and conversion into a public space has been deemed a massive success. It turned the area into a popular attraction and community site, created habitats for land, water, and air creatures, and reduced temperatures of nearby areas by over 30 degrees Celsius. There is so much more that we can do in cities to truly promote collective human and planetary flourishing. And I invite everyone on this call to join me in reimagining how we can design symbiogenetic processes and systems that encourage the world to work not against each other, but together. It's only then that we are able to achieve healthy human development that benefits all and cares for the planet that in that in turn, we depend upon to care for us. In the spirit of symbiosis, I uh, want to offer huge gratitude to my colleague, Joshua Vargas, who helped me to prepare this presentation. And also again, to my co-author, Michael Pollan, who um, much, of, much of what I've shared with you is from chapter four of Flourish. And I'm really um, so pleased that Dr. Hannah Bauman is joining us today to moderate this discussion. Uh, I know that Dr. Bauman has done amazing work in participatory governance and design alongside urban um, inclusion and exclusion. So I'm looking forward to hearing from her and really everyone's thoughts. Um, and in light of the important themes on which the IGP conducts its teaching and research, I wondered if we could maybe start with uh, these three. I wanted to offer three questions um, for discussion. So the first one is, given our highly connected world where cities feel more pressured than ever before to compete with one another for specific metrics that measure a specific vision of prosperity, how can we communicate to the decision makers and our fellow citizens the urgent need to reimagine prosperity and be critical of the co competition paradigm. Second, returning again to the beginning of the talk, the UK government in their leveling up white paper promises that it's possible to raise quality of life for all by bringing cities in every region up to a size and productivity closer to London without leveling down or decreasing the success, growth and output of London. Do we feel that this is possible in a way that also achieves a healthy relationship to the planet? Um, or to phrase this more broadly, is limitless growth compatible with our vision of prosperity? And finally, um, an open question, how have you been envisioning the relationship between humans and nature in your own work? How would your ideas, projects, and proposals work uh, within the symbiogenetic paradigm? Thank you very much, Sarah. That was uh, really inspiring, uh, especially these examples that that um, make it. We're having some silent claps here from the from the from the panel. Um, 
Um, yeah, especially these examples that make quite tangible how you see that these metaphors translate into real action. And I think the way you're thinking about these things aligns in many ways with the, with the kind of raison d'etre of the IGP, which is also thinking about, you know, filling metaphors or concepts with new meaning, especially this idea of prosperity, moving it away from economic indicators to uh, locally defined priorities and, and visions of what a good life is and what flourishing means. Um, and yeah, as you said, community involvement, participatory planning, these are all things we're also trying on, on small scales. Um, so yeah, again, lots of, lots of overlap there. Thank you also for the questions for, for our group discussion. I wanted to give the panel and the students who hopefully are, um, and, the, and the audience who are hopefully putting some questions already into the Q&A, uh, a few moments to gather themselves. And, and I had a question uh, trying to link um, the name of your consultancy to, to your presentation because uh, your organization is called Desire Lines. Uh, for people who don't know what that is, that's when people go off the trodden path, right? When, when for example, there's a, there's a paved uh, path somewhere, but actually the more direct route is across the grass and people trample the grass and cut across. So what it, I'm guessing why you chose this name and I'd love to hear more about it is that there's a sort of crowdsourcing uh, a wisdom of the crowd that goes beyond, that kind of trumps almost what designers have maybe conceived of as at their desk as they're sort of planning a place. Is there is there a way that beyond humans we can think desire lines also where places where nature perhaps forges this path where there's a certain intelligence or, or wisdom to nature um, that we can maybe learn to take into account better when when we're planning cities in particular. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing about that name. I often find I have to explain it. And um, I realize only belatedly after reg registering the business address that certain spam filters think that it desire lines mean something naughty, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, the uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree, uh, couldn't agree more. Um, and it's interesting to see here in Singapore, which has been um, there, there, there are many things that, that could be improved still, but I think that it has been a real leader in design uh, for nature and um, now moving towards design with nature. And one aspect of that has certainly been thinking about the lit literally the desire paths of different species, you know, the movement of nocturnal, um, you know, nocturnal animals you know, much, much like, you know, we've seen in the Netherlands, you know, the construction of infrastructure to try to counter the detrimental effects uh, to wildlife of human based, mostly car, car infrastructure. Uh, so there has been, there has been a shift uh, towards uh, looking at try, trying to, trying to unpick um, what could be best for, you know, more than human, uh, more than human life in our cities. And certainly it's a, we, we do our bit to try to facilitate that. Thanks. Um, we have quite a few questions already. Um, let's start with the panel. Bob Constanza, do you want to go first? Hi, thank you, Sarah. That was a great talk. And I think um, IGP and what we're trying to do here is totally consistent with what you've been, you've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> my own background is in architecture and systems ecology and ecological economics, which I think um, definitely is is uh, is pursuing the paradigm that we we live on a limited finite planet and we cannot uh, support unlimited growth of the material economy uh, indefinitely. And we've been uh, pursuing that paradigm for for quite a while, and also recognizing that we need uh, not just the built infrastructure and economic activity. We need social capital. We need you know natural capital. We need human capital in in a much more balanced way uh, in order to actually flourish and produce sustainable. Uh, sustainable well-being. Uh, so um, I think I think that's all consistent, and I think there are several other uh, others around the world who are all saying very similar things. Um, but I think one of the problems is how do we how do we make it clear that there is so much support uh, for these kinds of activities? Much more, I think, than most people uh, recognize. Certainly, than the mainstream media recognizes, which, as you say, is continues to push the unlimited growth. GDP growth at all costs agenda. And one of the questions we've been pursuing is, is well, uh, why are 
why is there this inconsistency? I think most people in the world really want the kind of eco village, you know, more equitable kind of uh, kind of environment, uh, but they're not they're not getting it. And uh, one one reason may be that we are literally addicted to the current system. All the positive short term feedbacks, you know, are really hard to break out of. We're kind of locked in uh, to this system. And so what we really need is is therapy uh, rather than than just pointing out that that we are in this problem. And, uh, um, you know, uh, again and again, what's what's the therapy? It turns out that one therapy that really works well at the individual scale is something called motivational interviewing, which focuses not on pointing out the problems, but pointing out, out or engaging with the addict in envisioning their life goals. And I think that's that gets back to, I think, one of your questions. How do we change the paradigm? I think that's really the main aspect of a therapy that might work at the societal scale is to get a new shared vision of what the, you know, what this better world could look like. And I think putting examples out there like eco villages and other other things that have worked and that that are doing the right thing. Uh, but I guess the challenge is how do you really spread that? How do you how do you get that participatory activity in uh, the the larger society in creating this this shared vision? How do we get everyone uh, or a lar large fraction of the population involved in that uh, <clears throat> in shared visioning process? Because I think that's that's the the way to change the paradigm. Thank you so much for all of that sharing. And I think it's, it's really important to say in response to that, that one of the reasons Michael and I wrote this book is because we have huge admiration for so many people who've been doing this foundational work for decades in these fields that we were shocked that more of our mainstream built environment colleagues were not aware of. So a huge point of Flourish has actually been to be to try to digest a lot of this amazing thinking that already exists and try to reinterpret it in a way that we feel that our mainstream built environment colleagues can perhaps be more receptive to. Um, because not everyone, I mean, I could show you my bookshelf, we're not all, not everyone has time to read all of the books. Um, I completely agree with you on the need for individual um, or psychological and um, psychodynamic transformation as well. And it's fascinating to see that so many of the elders in the intentional community movement, I'm thinking here of Lois Arkin, but also Robert Gilman, who I cited, um, have now been turning so much of their attention to the social dynamics, the, the personal transformation and interpersonal tools that are needed um, for transformation, understanding that it's not just if you build it, they'll come model, but actually understanding that there, there's a huge amount of transformational healing that needs to happen with the NS as individuals and cultures um, in order to allow, um, allow for that broader dissemination. Um, maybe one other point to, to introduce is, I mean, do people feel that we might be suffering through a time, is, is this a moment where there's a lot of pluralistic ignorance happening, where actually maybe a lot more of us have a longing for something different than the other system, as you can kind of see through, say, the Great Resignation, um, at least in the Anglo-American context, it hasn't so much happened so much in Asia, but, you know, are we in a moment when actually the mainstream media is not in fact speaking for the majority of what people want? Um, and there is a stronger role for everyone speaking up about, um, about the need for change. Yeah. Can I add, can I add just two more, maybe two more books to your bookshelf that you may, yes. you may not have seen or uh, <laughs> literatures that you may not have uh, seen, but there's the whole field of cultural evolution uh, that looks at how cultures evolve in in a way uh, analogous to the way to the way uh, biological evolution uh, happens, and that requires cooperation. Um, you know that's that cultures by their very nature are collections of individuals; are not individuals acting independently. And there's also been a lot of movement in the um, conventional biology, uh, evolutionary biology um, area, and some work by David Sloan Wilson and E.O. Wilson on multi-level selection. And once you recognize that not all natural selection is at the genetic level, it really is at multiple levels, including groups, including whole, uh, whole societies. 
uh, <clears throat> then you know that that sort of brings in the, the the fact that cooperation really is what made humanity successful as a species, not not individual cooperate um, competition. But you know the balance between, in some cases, competition works; in other cases, co more cooperation works. And it's not an either-or kind of thing. It's really a very complex uh, set of interactions. And I think the whole evolutionary paradigm, I think, is uh, needs to, to broaden out uh, to consider all of that. Thank you. I'd like to bring in Ida Kubizowski now. She has a question for Sarah as well. Thanks. Um, great talk, Sarah. Um, really enjoyed sort of the different, slightly different perspective on the stuff we're already doing. So that was great. Um, my question goes back to your discussion of competition. And I think competition can be actually quite good, or at least a co-opetition of collaboration and competition in some way together. Um, is there a way, for example, to restructure what we're competing for you know so for example the well there's a i don't know if you've heard of the well-being economy alliance it's a group that's bringing governments together um it's currently the founding ones were scotland iceland and new zealand um, finland wales have joined and canada just agreed to join actually um, and their focus is on improving well-being of their populations. And so can we create a competition within cities to focus on well-being or some kind of prosperity, however you define it, um, instead of GDP growth or um, economic growth? And how would that switch be possible? Thank you so much for bringing up the WeGo group. Um, I should just to be totally clear um i've just focused on one of five chapters of our book so we have our final chapter is actually all about planetary health and you know really inspired by kate Raworth and her colleagues around you know looking at new living metrics um for uh, to direct our growth to i completely agree i think it's i think it's a matter of um what our view of competition is do we see competition as something that improves everyone or do we see competition in which there is a winner and everyone else dies um, and i think that that's the kind of competition that uh i'm warning against um whereas yes there i mean there's definitely something about like you know a healthy spirit of all you know all trying to do our best together um But I, I suppose it's it's you know if, if ruh, ruh. sorry I'm back I'm just thinking if if one um do, you know to the winner do all the spoils go to the winner or is the idea actually that the winner is going to pull everyone along with them um yeah and would love to hear yeah, but I guess. But I guess, and I totally agree, um, but how do we change that focus from growth in GDP to growth in well-being or prosperity or however we define that and that shift? And slowly happening, how do we, I guess, accelerate it? And it might be a bigger question than you can answer because all of us are trying to answer that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that you are better positioned than I to answer that. Um, and I'm really looking forward to delving more into the IGP's work, this being my first time of contact with you. But I have been really heartened by examples of localization. You know, recently, the move to localize um, with the Donut Economics Action Lab, for example, um, or, you know, or seeing what comes out of maybe some of the smaller countries who are able to reprioritize that and perhaps able to, to reorientate much more quickly than some of the larger, um, alert, larger economies might be. So I think, I mean, from, from the, the work the i've had more interaction with city level mm -hmm. civil servants than national level city servants but i certainly know that everyone seems to be really driven by the case study you know they want to see it's being done successfully right. before and then they'll tweak it for their um right. for their uh, context so you know like singapore is looking to seoul or singapore is looking to what taipei are doing it um, right. 
So maybe some, there is something there, even though I know that there's a limitation to the case study that actually for some policymakers, it's incredibly helpful to have proof of concept that they can then tweak and scale. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we actually had another question in the Q&A on this uh, question of competitiveness. And I'll try to summarize because we're, we're nearing the end already. Nikolai Minchev writes, thank you for the fantastic presentation. You talked about competitiveness as a feature of capitalism at the beginning. I wonder if it might be useful to draw an analytical distinction between competitiveness and competition. Um, could we have a critique of capitalism that's based not on the critique of competition as such, but rather on pointing out the hypocrisy and internal contradictions of modern capitalist governance and emphasizing that supporting and protecting the resources of communities can strengthen capabilities for innovation and building local economies. Don't know if you want to take that as a question or we, we see it as a comment. I think it's a great observation. Um, and I think I think one of like one of the caveats that I'm always bringing to flourish is that um, we are looking at um, we're never seeing Michael and I are never presenting the paradigm changes as like a binary switch. It's really trying to look at um, a continuum of change. It's obviously that that is often how cultural revolution happens, right? Um, so it's not a matter of uh, just completely throwing away what we already have, but instead, like, what's the new um, lodestar that we're that we're trying to reorientate to? Mm -hmm. We have a few questions about specific urban contexts. Uh, here, uh, Hyo Jin Yang writes: In Seoul, around the Chogia Chun area. The real estate price is really high, so there are lots of companies, including investment banking and technology startups. These days, if government publishes uh, some development plan in a specific area, the real estate prices around that area will rise a lot, and that leads to crowding out local people. What do you think about those kind of problems? And also, um, my colleague Joshua, who helped with this presentation, of course, pointed out that traffic also went up on the adjacent street, even though it was displaced from the overpass that was destroyed. So yeah, we have we can't um, we cannot glorify um, any of these as you know perfect. I would go back to the previous example um, and the model of creating infrastructure like community land trusts. Um, so in uh, the area around the Los Angeles Eco Village, there's been you know what was absolutely you know, devastated um, in the mid nineties is now highly desirable uh, kind of urban real estate. Uh, but because the community did the hard work to integrate the uh, community land trust, it's meant they've been able to stabilize rental prices. So I think that there has to be those sorts of, those sorts of systems um, need to be implemented um, in addition to the more, you know, infrastructural interventions like the um, daylighting of the stream that we saw. Thanks so much for raising that point about that example. Yeah, also related to, um, to the stream, uh, an anonymous uh, participant writes, what a wonderful overview with great examples. Our town center in a North Lo London suburb is about to be regenerated. I'd quite like to think of a stream flowing down the high street instead of traffic. Uh, that is not related to flooding because of climate change, of course. So that's uh, a comment more. And then uh, Raphael. I just echo back that my hometown has a stream that everyone's been campaigning to have daylit for decades now. And I think if we, could, if we can finally move to recover our urban rivers, we'll. Yeah. We'll London, London has hundreds of them as well. Um, and perhaps uh, we'll make this uh, the final question because we're, we're uh, getting close to the end, unfortunately. A question from Raphael. A simple question, how to get started. I live in a building counting 180 apartments and there's a perfect unused space opposite the building, perfect for composting plus edible garden. How to get people on board, how not to feel nonstop overwhelmed as a social movement leader. And perhaps I can add on to that. Yeah, how do we scale up these initiatives that you've talked about? And I think this is a challenge we face uh, uh, alongside the paradigm shift is, is how once these ideas are there and they're being implemented, 
uh, in really inspiring ways on a local scale, how do you, how do you bring that then uh, to a much wider uh, public? So important to think about. Um, one of the, we, we start the book, we begin the book with um, trying to think about moving from a binary of optimism and pessimism to moving towards a viewpoint of possibilism and the potential for viral agency. Um, so thinking how can, asking our readers to think about how um, the concentric circles in which, actually quite like the IGP logo, <laughs> but like the concentric circles um, within which we have you know, different layers of influence. Um, and thinking about how if we, if we start at the middle, how can we interrelate that to you know, the structures of our family or our household or then to our employer or our school or then to you know, the um, boundary within which we can exert our electoral rights or you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think, but I don't think that that should be, that kind of ambition should also be something that is overthought to the point that it keeps us from starting small. Um, we, like we, we give the example of the, um, the Milwaukee urban reforestation models like started in Japan and then um, popularized, someone on the call know what I'm talking about. Um, it was it's this the intensive reforestation um, model that uh, could work for your site, work next to the compost bins, um, but it, it's intentionally meant for small scale bits of land, which otherwise might not um, have much perceived real estate value and have relatively low ecological value um, at, at present. So low potential to spontaneously um, renaturalize. Uh, anyways, it's a technique and is now been spread around the world, obviously using different species combinations. Um, and there's a movement, I think in North London, uh, a human rights lawyer um, has initiated a uh, community organization in North London, I think Camden, I want to say, um, to do this. And it's an example of a small, a small template example, but that is scale is scaling now around the world and would be easy-ish for any one of us on this call uh, to make possible in our local neighborhood. Thank you. Um, we've unfortunately come to the end of our lunchtime seminar. Um, I want to invite the panelists to join me in thanking Sarah Ichioka for the presentation um, and uh, to remind everyone that her book is now out, Flourish. Um, and thanks also to our audience members for all their engagement and their questions, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.